Good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here. We are uh, really excited to be hosting our annual State of the State uh, Forum with Governor Sununu. As you can tell, uh, a, a packed house, sold out event. Uh, thanks so much, everybody, for taking the time to, uh, to join us. And we've got a, a great program. Um, I'm going to dive right in uh, so that we can get to that great program. So I want to spend a moment and uh, introduce a few uh, special guests and board members that are joining us. Uh, first, we have uh, two former mayors of Manchester joining us this morning, Mayor Bob Baines and Mayor Silvio Dupuy. Mayors, thanks for being here. We also have a number of uh, chamber uh, board members joining us this morning. I'd like to uh, introduce all of them to you. As I mentioned in all of our events, our board plays a huge role in uh, ensuring the positive growth and direction of our organization. So we're very fortunate to have such an engaged, uh, strong board uh, working with the chamber. Uh, joining us from our board is Preston Hunter from Ekman Construction, who's also our new uh, board chair. Uh, Bill Brewster from Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare. Mike DeSell from UNH Manchester, Matt Cafori from Central Paper, Tom Malafront from Manchester Boston Regional Airport, Tony Matos from Altos, Dick Samuels from McLean Middleton, uh, Patrick Tufts from Granite United Way, Donna Gamash from Eversource, Nathan Saller from Bellwether Community Credit Union, Janella McDonald from Stibler Associates, Scott Spradling from the Spradling Group, Susan Heward from Manchester Community College, and Chris McCracken from Manchester Community Health Center. A round of applause for our board for joining us. So I'd also like to take a moment and thank our sponsors. Uh, without the support of our uh, corporate sponsors, programs like this, and all the work the Chamber does uh, throughout the year uh, would, would simply not be possible. And we're very fortunate to have a, a fantastic team of sponsors supporting our program this morning. Our presenting sponsor is uh, Dartmouth Hitchcock. Our corporate sponsor is Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare. Our advocate sponsors are Oracle Dine and New Hampshire Healthy Families. I'd also like to thank the New Hampshire Institute of Politics uh, for hosting. Neil Levesque, uh, Dr. DeSalvo, and Kim, the team here, are always do a great job. Um, and breakfast from St. Asim uh, Dining Services. Really appreciate their support and love coming to this facility uh, each year. To say a few remarks on behalf of our presenting sp uh, sponsor, Dartmouth Hitchcock, I'd like to welcome Dr. Joanne Conroy, who's the Chief Executive Officer and President of Dartmouth Hitchcock and Dartmouth Hitchcock Health, to say a few words. Dr. Conroy. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Dartmouth Hitchcock Health is really pleased to be sponsoring this event. And we are looking forward to hearing that governor's remarks. And I know I'm between you and those remarks, so I'll be succinct. I wanted to share with you three things that keep me up at night. And I know they're close to the governor's heart as well. The first is the changing face of healthcare. There are a lot of uncertainties to what we're facing in healthcare. As uh, Dartmouth Hitchcock Health, an anchor institution in the state, we're the largest employer, private employer in the state and you know frankly touch many of the communities across the state we have seen the slow erosion of our rural health care we are the most rural academic medical center in the country the next most rural academic medical center is mayo clinic and if any of you have been up to rochester minnesota that feels really rural but we are more rural than the mayo clinic what that means is we depend on a rural network of healthcare, not only to take care of people in the communities, but those organizations are also major employers in those communities. And I don't think we can underestimate how important they are. Unfortunately, in New Hampshire, we're developing things called maternity deserts because our rural healthcare organizations are starting to close their labor and delivery units because they can't support them. And so women are having to travel 90 minutes, sometimes two hours, to deliver their babies. So this is something that we have to work on as an anchor institution leading the conversation across the entire state. The second issue I want to talk about is the Doorway New Hampshire. It was a program with tremendous support from the governor. And I just want to give you an update. We are the after hours call center for 
the doorway in New Hampshire. For those of you that don't know about it, it's for opiate use disorders or any other substance use disorder where people can actually access help 24 hours a day. We maintain the after hours call schedule at Dartmouth-Hitchcock. We have this gigantic connected care center, so it just made sense for us to actually provide that service. So we get about one and a half calls a night. Um, people that access Doorway New Hampshire from locations that aren't able to offer the service after hours, and we direct them to appropriate supportive care. Um, we also are seeing about 20 new evaluations a month at Dartmouth-Hitchcock Lebanon, and there are a range of substances that people want help with. Opioids, alcohol are the most common. And then finally, I want to talk about workforce development. Probably that's something that this group is really interested in. We're almost a zero unemployment state, and many of you feel that. We have started developing some very effective pr apprenticeship programs where we actually take people who are underemployed, meaning maybe have a part-time job, or unemployed, and actually pay them to go to school to provide um, expertise as a medical assistant, a, a, um, a licensed practical nurse, a surgical tech, a pharmacy tech. What's fascinating is we've brought um, hundreds of people back into the workforce, number one, and number two, um, what's interesting is almost 30% of them are single moms, and this is a way to actually reintroduce them to the workforce, and every single citizen in the state is going to be somebody that we'll look to, we will look to to actually help provide the labor force we need to offer our services and certainly to deliver our health care. So again, I'm really proud that we are um, able to support an event like this, and thank you so much for your attention. We um, really, every day, appreciate um, the fact that we live in an amazing state and are just happy to contribute to it thriving in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne, and uh, thanks to you and the team at uh, Dartmouth-Hitchcock Health for supporting this event, but also the great things you're doing here in New Hampshire. All right, so before we uh, jump in, uh, just a little bit on the format. In just a minute, I'm going to introduce the governor and welcome him here up to the podium to say a few words and give his remarks. Um, and then we're going to do some Q&A. And the governor and I are going to sit up front here, and there are note cards on all of your tables. So if you have a question, uh, please jot it down. Hold it up, a member of the chamber staff will grab it and bring up as many questions as we can to me and we're gonna try and just get through as many questions as we can before we have to adjourn by around nine o'clock. Um, my one request is when you're writing down those questions, if you could try to keep them succinct and write really good, good penmanship, um, it'll be helpful for me to get through all of those questions. Really appreciate it. So uh, it's my uh, honor now to introduce uh, uh, Governor Sununu. Uh, governor Chris Sununu is New Hampshire's 82nd governor and is serving in his second term. Prior to being elected as governor, he served three terms on the New Hampshire Executive Council, representing 32 cities and towns in Rockingham and Hillsborough County. In 2010, uh, during his uh, part of his business private sector experience, Governor Sunu led a group of investors in the purchase of Waterville Valley Resort, where he worked as chief executive officer. Uh, prior to that, Governor Sununu was an owner and director of Sununu Enterprises, a family business and strategic consulting group. He focused much of his time on local, national, and international real estate development, venture technologies, and business acquisitions. Governor Sununu grew up in Salem, New Hampshire. Uh, he graduated from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology with a uh, Bachelor of Science in Civil and Environmental Engineering. And he lives in Newfields with his wife, Valerie, and their three children. Friends, please join me in welcoming our governor, Chris Sununu. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please, please. I love that Mayor Baines was the first one to jump up. I love you, buddy. Uh, well, thank you guys very much. So uh, this is great, a, a great opportunity. I've actually started going out and talking to um, a variety of different, whether it's chambers and rotary clubs and things like that. We've gotten through the budget process, uh, and it's a tough process to be sure. There's a lot of line items in that budget uh, to really dig down into. Um, 
and now it's really time to go out and talk about kind of where we are and, and, and where we need to go, some of the things that are happening up at the State House. And I think it's great that, you know, we can just, we'll take any question you want. Um, I always, I always say, you know, the hardest questions are from the fourth graders that do the tours at the State House, because they will ask anything, right? Um, how much money do you make? You know, do you like your job? You know, all this stuff. A lot about Donald Trump. It's funny. Uh, look, um, let's just do a kind of a quick overview. It is uh, a really good time right now to be in New Hampshire. It really is. And, and I think everyone, both in the business sector, um, in the public sector, in the private sector, uh, with, with the opportunities and the doors that we're opening for nonprofits, for families, for individual income, uh, things are really, really good right now. Uh, my message is it's not by accident. It's really not. Um, and, and it's not, um, I'm not up here to say, hey, you got to give, give me all the credit. Uh, it really took a concerted effort over the past few years to do a couple things. Um, you know, focusing on the needs of the state, being frugal with your budget, but being pri making sure you're actually putting emphasis on priorities and thinking not in two year cycles. I, I talk about this a lot. We had this tendency to, when you have to get elected every two years, and it's tough, as a governor or as you know, the largest parliamentary body in America, which we have, um, the politicians and the leaders tend to think in two-year chunks, right? Because they're thinking to the next election. We got to get rid of that. And we've really tried to force a, a new full, uh, mentality, something you folks all deal with in, in the private sector, but to think five and 10 and 20 years down the road, to think about rebuilding infrastructure, to, to think uh, and challenge ourselves to redesign systems to get the outcomes that we want. If you know the outcome you want, it's, for too often government tries to put the square peg in the round hole. Well, we'll just put more money at it. Eventually, something OK will come out the back end. We'll get something out of the back end if we push hard enough. right? Pushing harder in government is just throwing more money at something. But if you're not doing it right in the first place, you're, doing, you're just doing something wrong harder. right? You've got to challenge yourself sometimes to push in a whole different direction. And that's really what, what we've tried to do with opioids, with mental health, with issues with DCYF and abused kids, uh, really refocusing our priorities, challenging ourselves to see what problems are we kind of seeing today and being willing to address those today so they don't become crises of tomorrow. Um, Obviously, with, with, uh, as governor, a lot of that starts every, every cycle with the budget. It just does. That's where we set our agenda. We set our priorities. We tell the state uh, where we think we need to put a, a lot of our needs. And we have a lot of opportunity right now. We really do. Um, revenues is, are as, really as high as they've ever been. Now, the trick is letting, making sure the legislature understands that the revenues today of today are not going to be the revenues of tomorrow. We have a lot of one-time money right now. The Trump tax cuts worked. Whether you agree with these policies or not, boy, did they work. And there are companies that are flush with cash. There are companies that paid a lot of taxes into the state, that repatriated money. And long story short, we have about $200 million in one-time money to spend right now. It will not necessarily be there three and four and five years down the road. If you start spending that money on long-term programming, those programs will be out of money. And we're going to be in a real hole. It's exactly what the legislature did in 2006 and 2008. They spent money based on unrealistic uh, revenue projections. They didn't control their spending. And when the, f when the crisis hit, it really hit. Because not only was it hitting in the private sector, but we were left with nearly a billion dollar hole to backfill. The responsibility of leadership, whether you're, you're running the, your, your checkbook in your household or your business or as governor, is to make sure you're truly planning for the long term. But that creates a lot of opportunity for us as well. One time money, infrastructure, right? A lot of infrastructure opportunity. So when we have $65 million surplus, nearly a $65 million surplus in our education trust fund, we've really never had an opportunity like that before. Usually it's, it's a, a deficit and we have to backfill with general funds. So this is one time money. So what should we do with it? We should build, we should build schools. I wanna send every dollar of that back to property tax poor towns, towns that have trouble raising money on the property tax side to rebuild their schools, to rebuild their classrooms, to do their expansions, whatever it might be, because we don't have real, uh, uh, that school building aid formula uh, was tapped out years and years ago. But to spend $65 million over the next four years, $15 million a year, so some of these uh, smaller schools and, and tougher, more economically challenged districts can tap into that? Absolutely. That's a huge opportunity we can pro provide for education across the state. We talk about mental health a lot. Right? This state was a disaster with mental health. It was, just, it was terrible. I could go on days about how bad the system really was. And so we took the bull by the horns and we said, we're not going to let that be our long-term future. And so we, 
couple things. We did a, a few bills last year which started the ball rolling, put some funding in, into some new beds here, into some new programs there. But most importantly, we, I said, we got a plan, right? We need a plan. We're going to put together a 10-year plan for mental health. And was the plan written by Health and Human Services? Nope. Was it written just by the providers and by the legislature? Nope. We had the stakeholders write it. We had the parents come in. We had the families come in. We had those on the front lines come in with public meetings all across the state and said, tell us where the system is breaking down. If, you're not, if we don't know where the system is breaking down, then it's a bunch of legislatures in the state house talking to themselves and nothing gets done. That's the way we did it for years, no more. We're going to let stakeholders drive the new policy. We're going to let stakeholders drive the solutions. And they essentially wrote the 10-year mental health plan. Can we do all of it tomorrow? No. It's a 10-year it's a plan, right? But let me tell you, we're really accelerating it. We're doing more than half of those suggestions that were brought to us, both on the regulatory side, on the funding side. We're really accelerating it. Um, and and I, think, uh, I think we're going to get pretty much there. I think everyone is pretty much on board with what we've proposed in our budget. And the big piece is the 20-year project everyone's been talking about is the secure, secure psychiatric unit. This is really, really critical for a variety of reasons. There's this like a domino effect with mental health. And what, what happens is if you don't take care of these issues here, you get backups through the whole system. And the result is you get people waiting in emergency rooms. We've heard the stories. You've walked, some of you have walked the emergency rooms. And you get people waiting for services, just being maintained, not for hours, not for days, but for weeks. Imagine your kid sitting in an emergency room for weeks on end, potentially, waiting for mental health services because we have a backup. So we're going to take care of that. And what I did is I brought in four or five folks, and I said, I want all the constituents on, on the table, children with mental health issues, folks in the secure psychiatric units, the fact that we have people in our prison waiting for quality mental health services in prison. It's, it's, it's not right. The fact that we have um, uh, you know, the criminally insane folks up at, up at Laconia. Um, we have kids in, sitting in New Hampshire Hospital that it's a good facility. Don't, New Hampshire Hospital is a great facility, not quite designed for kids. I mean, they provide good services, but let's put kids in a place for kids with kids' services because it's so different than adults, right? Let's get community beds going so we can actually let people get care in their communities instead of saying everyone has to be pushed into one centralized institution. So by putting $40 million of one-time money out, we're not borrowing money. We've got cash. Let's spend it. Let's build this thing today. And by doing that, you release all the, the backlog in the emergency room. You provide kids a better place to go. You take care of the building, the, a, a priority of building 40 new community-based beds right, for those types of services. Now, you can put all the infrastructure into mental health or any of these programs you want. You, it's great to build infrastructure. You don't have the workforce, it ain't going to work, right? So we need to focus on workforce. And as was mentioned, we're, as you mentioned, we're essentially a zero, we have essentially have zero unemployment, 2.4%, the lowest unemployment in the country. I remember when I got elected, um, I thought, gee, the one thing I'm going to have, it was like 2.8 at the time. And I thought, there's no way this goes lower. And I just know the Democrats are like, oh, this is going to be great. Unemployment has to go up. And I don't know how we did it. I mean, I know how we did it. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but it's amazing. We've gotten our unemployment to 2.4%, and we're a victim of our own success. So we have to focus on workforce. So part of this one-time money, $24 million, doubling the number of nurses and healthcare workers that come out of our university system. Done. Tomorrow. That's cash. We're going to build those systems and make sure that, again, the need of 5 and 10 and 20 years down the road, the healthcare workforce is going to be there for us. The need in mental health is going to be there. The need with opioids, that workforce will be there. We have this amazing, we live in an amazing place. And sometimes um, I don't think we, we realize it. Not only do we live in the most robust economy in the Northeast and the most robust economy in the world, but the fact that we're 30 miles north of the healthcare center of the universe, and we have a place like Dartmouth-Hitchcock that provides world-class health care for us. That's great, but boy, is that competition, right? I mean, it's very easy to have our nurses be drawn right down to Boston. You know, we want them to be trained and, 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 and stay here. So by doubling the capacity of the nurses, that's one thing. But how do we know we're not going to lose them? We're going to tie these programs. We're going to hardwire them into our providers before they graduate. Right? In, the, in their freshman and sophomore year, we want them doing the internships. We want them building connections with our providers early on. Similar to what we're doing with our career academies in education. You know, I'm a big believer in our CTEs, our career technical schools. They're phenomenal. We're putting a lot of money into those schools. We're going to rebuild a whole new one down in Hudson. We're finishing the project out in Rochester. Um, those really provide opportunities for freshmen and sophomores in high school to really get those workforce-ready skills so that at the age of 18, they have the choice to find their pathway forward. And this year, there's something even more exciting. Uh, Frank Adelblut uh, and the folks at Department of Education have come up with something that is already starting to be replicated across the country, this idea of what we call the career academies. 
right? Leave it to a Republican to get full day kindergarten funded. Leave it to a Republican to find a way to do free college without a single taxpayer dime, right? A, a single additional dollar. The way we do it is this. We find it, it's so simple. It was sitting right in front of us. A year of high school on average costs a student about 15,000, costs the state about $15,000, right? A year of community college on average costs about 7,500. Hmm, must be a way to make that math work a little better. So now we're going to let students who want at their choice to take their fourth year of high school, split it into two, do a fourth and a fifth year in a charter school embedded in the community college. So they're getting dual and concurrent enrollment for the exact same dollars. And when they graduate, they get their high school diploma and they get their associate's degree. It didn't cost taxpayers a dime. It created an opportunity for those students. And it's, again, hardwired with private partners, whether it's in healthcare or manufacturing or whatever it might be within the community colleges. So every kid is guaranteed an interview on day one. Every kid is already doing those internships before they graduate. And we're providing that gateway, that opportunity. And then when you look at what we're expanding within the community college system, whether it's the LPN and nursing programs, uh, manufacturing, robotics programs we can invest in now up in Plymouth State that have never been thought about, but we've never even made that, that motion before, but now we have the money to do it. These are all pieces that have to go together to make sure we're driving a workforce for the 21st century. It isn't just throwing money at it. It's trying to think a little creatively about doing it differently. Is there another way to skin the cat, so to say? I have a cat, I shouldn't say skin the cat. I don't know where that phrase came from. But is, what really is challenging ourselves, is there a better way to do this? Career Academy is just a great example. Not gonna cost anyone a thing except open opportunity for these students. Um, you know, we're doing a couple other, other things that I just wanna to, uh, touch upon a little bit and then we'll jump right into the questions. You know, we're, everyone knows, I focus a lot on early childhood education. And we've done, you know, whether it's kindergarten, I w I'd love to get a QR, it's called the QRIS system, which really doesn't fund preschool, but actually starts putting them on, on a system of, of uh, almost like a rating system, if you will. That's getting a lot of pushback. But most importantly, I want to bring in an early, um, uh, early childhood education director. And, and it's a little like what we deal with our veterans. We have great veteran services. We have a lot of nonprofits out there. We have folks at Health and Human Services that deal with veterans. We have folks at the, at the, at the Guard that deal with veterans, folks within our VSOs, our veteran service officers. But they're all out here, they're all doing good stuff, but they're not really coordinated. Let's get them coordinated to a single point. Why? Because it's easier for you. It's easier for the consumer, for the customer. A single point of reference. And General Michaelitis taught me something very early on. You know, General Michaelitis, when, we, when I interviewed him for the new adjutant general of our National Guard, he's just been tremendous. And I interviewed a lot of folks and he kind of leapfrogged a few folks. We had amazing candidates. So it was, it was one of those things where it's unfortunate you only, have to pick, you only can pick one. But one thing that got, got it with me, that got me with him, was he said uh, three words, soldier for life. He said, when you sign to be in the military, whether it's the Guard or the Army or the Navy or the Coast Guard, whatever it is, you're signing on to be a soldier for life. And so we used to have active military here and veteran stuff over there. One, one point of, of entry, one point of, of lifelong services. And so we're gonna create, we're gonna change the National Guard into the Department of uh, Military Affairs and Veteran Services because again, we want it to be seamless. We want you to have that one-stop shop. We wanna work seamlessly with the federal government. And when you do that, everything just becomes easier. And you don't get all this bureaucracy, you don't get all these layers of administration. And the, and the services just come out that much quicker. We're going to do the same thing with early childhood education, right? A single point of contact that works with health and human services, that works with the Department of Education, brings it all together, works with all the nonprofits, so that when you have a need, there is a single point of contact you go to that is kind of managing where all these moving parts are and can let you or your community know exactly what services might be available, and more importantly, let us know exactly where, where the holes might be. My wife did, uh, Valerie did this amazing thing. You know, Val, for those of you who have met Valerie, she's Shockingly amazing. I'm shocked every night I go home, I, how lucky I am. I really am. And uh, she's amazingly shy though. And uh, she doesn't like the spotlight or anything, but she really wanted to challenge herself. And, and one of her passions, she was a special ed teacher. And one of her passions is obviously early childhood education. And very quickly early on, she started bringing in all these groups from across the state to talk about issues, where we go next. We'd come into the Bridges House. And it was very apparent to us that uh, HHS and Department of Education weren't really talking, not because they didn't get along, because it was one of those things, it's like a big company. You see emails from someone all the time from within your company and you're like, who is that person? They're always, I, don't, I haven't met that person, who's Diane, right? So you had two giant departments working to help kids, kind of talking but not really interacting. 
And the left hand didn't completely know what the right hand was doing. And it was really Valerie that brought these folks together and brought them all to the Bridges House one day, right? A bunch of employees from, from both departments. And it was like, you know, the two great countries coming, oh, hi, how are you? Oh, yeah, that's you. Oh, I've seen your name on a, that piece of paper for years. That's so great, I finally get to meet you, right? And they came together and they started working and we started realizing where there were duplicative efforts, where there were gaps in the system. And that's what really co cultivated this idea of these single points of contact where, again, all of this stuff can be coordinated and work with both departments and work with the private and nonprofit sector at the same time. Um, I'm going to wrap it up. I mean, we're, we're looking at, we're, I'm, I'm, we're focusing on pediatric cancer, right? We have a pediatric cancer issue. We have bloodborne pathogen issue with ticks. I got a war on ticks I'm about to unleash because <laughs> I'll tell you, I'm really serious about it. There are families that get devastated. We have 14 bloodborne pathogens now in this state that have been identified, completely debilitating to some folks, lifelong illnesses. We just kind of have kind of come to accept it. We shouldn't do that. We should be aggressive about it and find out what we can do. So things like this that aren't really cutting edge issues, don't really make the headlines, we're still going after them. Because again, we don't want the problems of today to become crises of tomorrow. The big thing though, I, I, gotta, I gotta hammer on, one of the most important things you can do in leadership, as Governor or, or Kyle York running Oracle, or Joanne over at Dartmouth, um, you gotta say no sometimes. And, and I'll be a little harsh, you gotta shut stupid at the door, right? You do. When, bad, when really dumb ideas are out there, you gotta just hammer it down and say, what are you talking about? Absolutely not. Don't waste my time. I got, we got enough things to worry about. Let's focus on our real priorities. And let's remember what New Hampshire is all about. So when we talk about income tax, when we talk about a billion dollar carbon tax, when we talk about canoe taxes, you hear me talk about this one in the budget? They want to tax canoes. The Democrats have been given leadership for the first time in both houses with a Republican governor since the Civil War. And what are they doing with it? They're going so far, I don't want to say wacky, I'm not going to use that word, but it's wacky. <laughs> They're going so far. It's like, my God, do you understand what the New Hampshire advantage is? This isn't some colloquial thing we just toss around, oh, it's the New Hampshire advantage, we got it. No, we've earned it. We've earned it by staying disciplined, by not having sales tax, by not having an income tax, by having a, a small regulatory structure so businesses and, and individuals can design their path of their own. We are the live, free, or die state. It is not four words on a license plate. I say that one all the time too, but it isn't. It's how we truly live our lives. And the circus theatrics of Washington stay in Washington, please. You've heard me say it before, when it comes to Congress, Senate, fire them all. I think they're all absolutely useless. Fire them all. They are. And I mean that very sincerely. I don't think there's any single person in, in Congress or in Senate that can stand up and say, look what I've done from a leadership position. Look where I've had the courage to try to design a new system, challenge my party a little bit, go a, a slightly different way. Very few of them can actually stand up and say that. It's embarrassing, but we need their help. I spent a lot of time in DC. I was with Secretary Wilkie of the VA talking about what we're doing over at Pease, talking about what we're doing with our new veteran services stuff. I was with Secretary Chow because there's a big transport infrastructure bill that's gonna come up and we have an opportunity to get some real money with infrastructure into the state and across this country, it's tremendous. I spent time with the president talking about the importance of getting the United States, Mexico, Canada agreement ratified. Canada loves it, Mexico loves it, the US loves it, Congress has to do their job and ratify it. That's the last step. But if they don't, these terrorists will stay in place and that's detrimental to our economy and we all agree on that. But we spend time down there working to design these better solutions and open up doors of opportunity. This is not a game. Our great economy didn't happen on accident. We don't have the lowest poverty rate in the country on accident. We don't have some of the highest wages in the country on average on accident. We've earned it. And you can't just start saying, well, I'll do whatever the, the, the National Democratic Party wants, all this ultra progressive stuff. Holy cow, is it detrimental. Massachusetts is doing it. Connecticut is doing it. New York, California. Every time those states pass a, a bill, I call it the New Hampshire Jobs Act, for God's sakes. It's great. It's great for our economy. Every time they raise taxes in New York, we go to New York, we hold job fairs, and we bring businesses and families in. We had more young families move into New Hampshire last year than in the past 15 years. Things are turning around here. It's the model works. Cutting business taxes work. Opening up opportunity works. Why would we go backwards? And we have a lot of economic opportunity in the government at the state. We don't need more taxes. I don't need your money. I wanna give you more tax cuts, frankly. I mean, that's what we're trying to do. The Democrats have a very different philosophy. 
And let me tell you, if they start getting it passed, we're in trouble. We really are. We'll always be okay, but we'll be okay. This is New Hampshire. We are the gold standard for what we're doing. We're setting the gold standard with the doorway, the hub and spoke model. We're setting the gold standard with where we want to take mental health, our issues with DCYF, with education, right? We, we are setting these, these new bars, these new levels of excellence. Why would we go backwards on that? And we do it not because the government is getting bigger and we're taking more control, right? We're doing it because we're empowering individuals and we're empowering communities and we're empowering your individual freedom, whether it's in your business or your family or your kids, whatever it is. It is your choice. When you do that, amazing things happen. You get government out of the way. And that's the really comes the choice. Do you want to keep putting more money, more taxes into government and let them deciding what your path is? Or do you really believe that the New Hampshire advantage is what it is? It's about individual freedoms and letting folks drive their own solutions. We've got the best and brightest people in this state. Why would we ever want government to get in their way? So I'm very passionate about it, in case you can't tell. I think you need to be passionate too. You know, you need to call your representatives. You need to call your senator and say, what are you doing, right? I've got a lot of red pens. I'm going to veto a lot of stuff. I can't wait for that income tax to hit my desk. I'll veto it three times over, and then maybe four. Just to make the point, this is not what New Hampshire is about. And I'm not vetoing it for me or for my party. I'm vetoing it because I represent 1.35 million people that are depending on me to veto that kind of nonsense and send it back and keep this New Hampshire advantage. All right, I'm sorry, I'm eating up all your time. I'm getting all excited. I love, I, look, thank you guys very much, I appreciate it. Bob got me all riled up, all riled up. All right, we've got uh, about 30 minutes for a Q&A. I've got a few to start us off, but I saw a lot of writing uh, during the governor's remarks. So if you have note cards, hold them up. Staff is gonna collect them and run them up to me as quickly as they can. So governor, I wanna start uh, with economic development uh, because it's uh, the top strategic goal for our chamber and um, we're pretty excited because there's been a lot of great uh, projects happening in and around our region recently. Um, we had the great news with BAE, uh, which uh, the Department of Business and Economic Affairs, great partnership with the city of Manchester. We have really exciting project in the Milliard with Army. Um, so I was wondering if you could comment on, you know, aside from some of the legislative issues you talked about you think are important to the business climate, um, what else from a business climate perspective uh, perhaps speaking w in terms of Commissioner Caswell and the work as he's doing, what changes have you seen over the last couple of years that are helping make some of these projects move forward? So uh, one of the most important things, I think, is, is the regulatory reform. And, and let me tell you, regulatory reform is actually one of the hardest things to do. There's a lot of rules you can break down within your departments and agencies. But to get the legislature to really get on board with, with cutting rules, at, at some point, you can. every rule was created through some type of justification. Well, we need this rule because, you know, we have this issue here and that rule will take care of that, but there was really no consider for the, for the unintended consequences to the rest of you know, the state and industry. So you can always justify every rule and regulation. So it's actually quite hard to get rid of it. It's like a tax. Once you create it, it's really hard to lower it unless you have Republicans in control. Um, but, but really, so the regulatory reforms we've been able to do, I think, um, have opened a lot of gateways and doors. And that, when, when businesses come in, and they get a phone call from the governor or from Taylor or whoever it is, and we say, all right, let's sit down, let's talk about plans, let's get moving. Businesses are, I think, thrilled with how fast we can move. Uh, not just here in the state, but, but out, 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 outside of the state. Um, that's because we have a, a, not just a, 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 a low amount of, of bureaucracy and regulation, but just the access. The fact you have your representatives that can pick up the phone to the governor or the senators or individuals and citizens. I mean, half of this room has my cell number, for goodness sakes. But that, that type of access has, has been very, very important to a lot of different businesses. And appreciating that a business can pick up in California and move to New Hampshire like that now. It is not like it was 10 or even 20 years ago. Businesses can and will move on a dime. Um, and so we have, that's a huge opportunity for us as these other states are going in the absolute opposite direction. Also, some of the innovative things, not to be repetitive, but the things we're doing on workforce, right? Um, I, just saw, I just saw, I'm gonna embarrass her a little, I just saw Maureen walk in. You know, FIRST Robotics. Why do I love Dean Kamen and FIRST Robotics so much? It's opportunity for kids. It's opening a door of opportunity for young kids, for girls to get involved in science and technology, for problem solving, for really advancing what we call the soft skills of, of team building and working together. 
and I mean, I'm trying to get these programs all over the state. In fact, if you if you have a company and you haven't invested in some type of first robotics program, you're doing a, yourself a disservice. There's there's the commercial for Dean. Tell Dean I said it. Uh, but I really mean it. These types of opportunities, businesses want to come in, and they want to see those programs. It's not just what tax break are you going to give me, right? They want to see 10 and 20 years down the road what what are we doing? And finally, the last piece is housing. There are some communities in the state that have really gone on, on board and advanced their ability and their investment in kind of that mid-range housing, which we've been lacking. Some communities are way not on board, and it's a problem, and we're trying to get them to realize you've got to talk to those businesses in your area because they will not be expanding and coming here if you don't make investments in apartments and the nice condos and all that stuff that someone making fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 can afford. So there's, I, I hate using the word affordable housing and all that because it gets so misused, but you know, that mid-range housing that, that we really need. Rochester, doing great work. Some, uh, some places up north, Londonderry, another good example, doing some great work advancing that. And guess what? That's where the businesses are going, right? You want business in your communities, you gotta invest in the housing piece. We are a local control state, so you gotta work. I can't just go over and, and force it on them, but um, we can work with them, and that's where Taylor comes in, and, the, and Bob Scott at Environmental Services, we'll bring the whole team in, work with the locals, and find a, a pathway to make sure the state and locals are working hand in hand. When businesses see that, amazing things happen. I wanna stay on affordable housing, workforce housing, uh, just because we had an audience uh, question submitted about uh, commenting on initiatives related to affordable housing. What I'd like to ask you about is, there's a couple of pieces of legislation uh, that are working their way through the process that are targeted at this issue. Um, uh, one is looking at injecting some funds into the uh, workforce housing fund uh, uh, that can then be doled out to different projects to help finance them and, and your thoughts and, and whether that's something you're, you're supportive of. And then uh, there's also a, uh, a piece of legislation that is uh, coming back from last year that is a housing appeals board uh, bill that would, to your point about some of those communities that are not quite on board with um, uh, offering a balanced approach to housing, um, this would allow another recourse for some of those projects to get a fair hearing. Um, is that a concept that you've considered uh, the, and think about? So the two answers there are yes and yes. Uh, I think we need to put more money into, into, into the housing fund that was established. We kind of, we put a few million in every couple of years, but we have, again, we have some one-time money, the opportunity to really fund it uh, appropriately and provide opportunities to cities and towns. I do like the idea of a housing appeals board. Um, I know this is somewhat controversial, um, but it isn't just to say, well, I didn't like the results, so now I'm gonna go to the state. It's for folks that were, there was a real injustice at the local level. That's really what it is. And it's just a board that says, look, if, you, if, the, if both sides followed all the rules, the decision was made. But there's a lot of subjectivity in there and there's a lot of pushing of the rules sometimes at the local level. And I see a lot of nodding of the heads. It's just, we know that's the way it works, unfortunately. That's not fair. I'm a huge believer of the rules. My, it's something my parents ingrained in me early on. Even when you don't like the rules, you gotta follow them. And, every, and making sure the rules are the same for everyone, I'm a big believer in that. It's the great equalizer. And again, it's about equal opportunity. And then you let people all play by the same rules. Um, if people are, if there are cities and towns that are being a, a bit unjust in terms of how they're, they're permitting this stuff, I have no problem with the board at the state level that just provides a, an avenue for folks uh, to appeal to. Uh, I wanted to ask you about family medical leave because that's another issue that's working its way through the legislature. And actually, we had a related question of um, how can New Hampshire support working parents and families before their kids reach kindergarten to encourage young families to live and work here? So maybe you could talk about uh, your proposal on this and your thoughts on the proposal that is working its way through the legislature and you know some of your sure. concerns with that. So let, let me, let's be just really blunt. Uh, the proposal that the Democrats have put up is a disaster. It is an income tax. It mandates every one of you and every one of your employees to be into a system whether you like it or not. And they take it out of your wages. They call it a premium on wages. It's not an income tax, it's a premium on, are you kidding me? I mean, it's insulting. How dumb do they think everyone is? Everyone has to pay in. It comes out of your income. It's an income tax. Um, other states have done this. Look at New York. They're in financial trouble. You're essentially, I uh, have to force the government to hire about 40 or 50 more people so that we can become an insurance company, right? It is government first mentality. They didn't think creatively about this. They didn't think, well, we want this type of family leave program in New Hampshire, which I want and I support, and I've talked about it for three years. So after the bill was defeated last year, they weren't willing to change it. Did we just go away and say, okay, we don't have to deal with that anymore? No. We went in the back room, we worked hard for three or four months, and we crafted a new, a, a new way to do it. And we worked with the Department of Insurance and Employment Security, we brought in the private sector, and our plan is so simple. We realized, again, it was right in front of us. 
We have 10,000 state employees. What if we pay and buy family leave just for them at the state level? It's a benefit. We already provide benefits for our employees, health insurance and supplemental insurance. This is another you know, insurance product we'll add on to the system. Easy, we do it all the time. It'll cost it like two million bucks. In doing that, you've created such a large pool, it becomes stable, the premiums are very low, the private sector wants to come in, we're gonna use their expertise and their staff because they're already running a lot of this stuff in the private sector, and we're simply going to say you now have to offer that premium to businesses all around the state. And because they have a stable pool, the rates are really low. And if you want in, you can be in. If the employer wants to provide it for the employees, they can do that. If an employee themselves wants to come in, they can come in. It is your choice. And the system is completely financially solvent because it's being backed by these large insurance companies that do this all over the place already. Not, at, not with paid family leave, but they have other insurance products out there and you're part of like this larger pool, right? So it's creating a, an associated health plan, which I know a lot of folks in this room very much like, as, as do I. It's really, really creating an associated health plan for family leave. Whether you want in, you can pay in, and it's gonna be a low rate. You don't, you don't have to. Talk about the New Hampshire advantage. We just found another way to do it, and guess what? I'm, gonna, uh, I'm very proud of our team. It was such a good idea, other states are looking to take this on. They're going, yeah, that's a really good idea. A real easy way to do it. We don't have to raise taxes to do it. We don't have to mandate anything, and we give every, everyone that wants their six weeks. They can, they can take six weeks if they need it, if they wanna buy into the plan. The problem with the Democrats' plan originally was that it wasn't solvent. And even the insurance commissioner came up and said, I can't certify that there's gonna be money in this fund down the road. He said that in front of the legislature. Meaning, if you, had, if you were paying into the system, you're a single mom paying into the system, three years down the road, the fund goes insolvent. Uh-oh, what now? They had no plan B. So they realized, oh, financially it doesn't work. So they said, well, I guess we have to own up to it and, and admit that this is a tax and, and force everyone into the system. It's a bad idea. It's not even a kind of good idea that can be, no, it's a terrible idea for the state. Ours is a, a way to do it that doesn't force the mandate, that allows choice. Uh, and and to, again, the fact that it's being you know, replicated by other states right now, um, it's a great source of pride. We figured out a better way to do it. Uh, part of your remarks focused on school building aid and how the one-time money uh, presents an opportunity to send some needed funds back to uh, municipalities to invest in their education systems. So the question though from the audience was how do we sustain that? Those needs don't end. Um, so you know if you're making these one-time investments, you know, is the state able to sustain this type of support and are there changes the state could make in the future to better sustain a more consistent level of funding? Um, the answer is I'm not sure. So our plan puts together uh, basically $15 million a year over the next four years, which is a little more than school building aid uh, allocated in the past. It takes care of us for four years. Um, I'm not sure what options we can go to after that. I mean, we will have other, other options. Um, as we pay down the debt on school building aid, I'd love for the program to come back in some form, to be sure, so that you know, uh, uh, low, low, I'll call them property poor, uh, property tax poor towns, uh, towns that just don't have a lot of the financial um, ability that, that other towns do, can be really be first in line to take advantage of low rates to borrow uh, uh, from the state to use some of those funds to make those, those expansion projects work. Right now, I mean, I, I'm, I'm willing to, to look at that. We don't need to right now because we actually just have cash in hand. So, uh, and again, instead of just spending the cash over the next year, we want to spread, over, over, spread it out over the next four, and I think more opportunities open up down the road. Another question was, what are your priorities for our aging population? Our pro so, oh, for the, the seniors? Is that what we're talking, okay. Just, am I aging? The no, no I'm look at say. my hair, my hair's falling out like, I'm gonna look like Bob pretty soon here. Um, <laughs> governor, ten being, being a governor tends to just let it, I, I would rather it go gray. I wanna be the distinguished gray, but it's just falling out at this point. So I don't know what that means. Um, oh, aging, sorry. I, uh, so the aging population, let's talk about seniors. Reskilling, right? So a lot of what we're trying to focus on is create new, more innovative ways to reskill the workforce. So again, whether you're 45 and aging, 55, 65, 75, you wanna re-enter the workforce, right? We're gonna make it easy for you. And so what we're doing is doing a, a couple programs with both the private sector, we're trying to incentivize the private sector to create their own re-education, reskilling program so you can go work for a tech company. You can be 55, selling cars your whole life, you wanna make a career change, you can go work for a tech company. We'll help incentivize them with programs that help reskill you into what the needs of that company are. 
having the community colleges much more integrated with the private sector to understand what the needs of the business sector are, not just what you know, diplomas that uh, the community college and the university think we're going to need, actually bringing the private sector in so you create those partnerships and relationships, especially in, in healthcare. I'm, I'm gonna jump a little bit here. You know, when it comes to an aging population, one, one of the areas of priorities where we're trying to incre increase rates is for home nursing. But the vast majority of folks, as they become more elderly, isn't just to institutionalize them into a nursing home. For some people, you have to do that, of course. Um, but for some folks, the best care, the, most, the best quality care at the lowest cost is to have in-home nursing, right? And so reskilling your family members, right, or a parent, and being able to pay them a, a, an, an, an appropriate rate, an appropriate wage, if you will, to help take care of a loved one. That saves the state money, it provides a better uh, quality of life in, uh, at home, and so there's an, an opportunity there in terms of the reskilling workforce. We have um, elderly, uh, I don't want to say elderly, my, if my, dad, my dad's almost 80, if he knew I was calling him elder, elderly, <laughs> we're all done. Um, I'm gonna get the hook right off the stage. But some of the folks that are aging, that want to become nurses, that want some of those basic life skills, that want to be uh, work on the more social side of, um, of uh, some of that peer-to-peer -peer type stuff that we do within the elderly community. That, those are all great opportunities, so making those investments um, and those incentives really work, I think is a, a huge opportunity. So, uh, sticking with healthcare, there's a question about Medicaid payments. I wanna thank whoever submitted this card because they gave acronyms and definitions of those acronyms at the bottom, so it's, we're, you guys are getting really good at this. Is there a way to increase Medicaid payments to help with the uh, OB desert, delivery desert, uh, that Dr. Conroy mentioned, and the uh, behavioral health workforce without a broad-based tax? Um, is there a way to do it? Yes. Uh, it doesn't mean you can increase every rate every year. So this year we prioritize some of our rate, incre in, our rate increases on um, uh, home nursing and, and some, some areas like that. Uh, we increased the rates on mental health a bit last year, and we're going to maintain those those increases going forward. Uh, we didn't, we weren't able to increase them again. Um, so unfortunately, you you have to prioritize. There are some there are some constituencies in the state, and, and uh, mental health is really one of them, where there there hasn't been major rate increases for five or ten years. So we kind of have to start cycling our way through a lot of these folks. We did a lot of it with. Um, the opioids, obviously, the rates and the Medicaid rates for opioids were, were very low. We increased both the room and board rate. We pushed another rate increase on top of that because that was really the, the tip of the spear issue for us. Um, there's opportunity. doesn't mean you can do every rate every year. This year, because we have the one-time money where we're trying to help with areas of, of mental health and the Medicaid rates with mental health or, or the, medic, the, the traditional Medicaid rates uh, with acute health care, uh, is building into that infrastructure, right? We're build, we, we have the one-time money for the beds. Let's build the beds. Let's focus on the workforce issues. It doesn't mean we'll never do the rates, but um, you kind of have to cycle through them. You just can't increase every rate every year. But yeah, there's, there's opportunity there. Uh, and if I could just also talk, you know, when and, and uh, Joanne brought up a great point, you know, especially, you know, we're in Manchester right now, and we say it all the time, but do we really appreciate, have you driven an hour and a half north lately? And I really mean that. I was up in Bethlehem again this past week. I was up snowmobiling, stopping in and talking to businesses. There really is a desert out there for a lot of different uh, issues, but number one, uh, obviously, being healthcare. And increasing competition in healthcare, increasing accessibility there, and you know, I always go back, we talk about Medicaid and Medicare, we talk about a healthcare bill at the federal level, which they absolutely have to do. Healthcare reform is critical and they've completely dropped the ball. But most importantly, is in all, a lot of these issues, we're still talking about the insurance rate, nothing was bill. There he is, Harvard Pilgrim, great sponsor. Um, and, and I talked to Lisa at Anthem, nothing against the, the insurance companies. But you know what we really have to start doing? Can we start talking about the price of Tylenol? Can we start, start talking about the price of the liver transplant? You know, when you create competition and you focus on those prices, and it's hard. The costs that these hospitals have to bear are high. The administrative costs, the overhead costs, the legal liabilities that they have, and that creates upward shift in a lot of these costs that unfortunately a lot of them have to be trans transferred down to us. So again, whatever the government can do to create a, a, an ease of regulatory barriers for the healthcare providers, an ease of those barriers so that ultimately those cost benefits can be shifted down to you. I mean, it has to start through the hospitals and through the providers and through those local networks. But boy, can we, we really need to, to aggressively dig into how we start creating better, better competition and essentially you know, pushing those costs down so that they, don't, they aren't forced to basically send those you know, $100,000 bills. Um, and and it, it's tough, it really is. And so that access to, to, to rural care is really, really critical. 
You talked a lot about workforce, and there were a, a number of questions about workforce development in a couple of different ways um, that I'm going to try to bundle up into just one general question. And I wanted to go back to something you talked about, I think it was last year. Um, in your first term, you created a Millennial Advisory Council to try and learn from young professionals some of their concerns, challenges, what the state can do better to engage them. And I was wondering if, you know, a year later, uh, what have you learned from that initiative and where do you think, where do you see that going? Put 24 millennials in the room, right? And say, start talking. And admit you will learn a lot. How many, are, how many are 35 or under in this room? Not bad, not bad. Um, I think you're technically millennials, maybe, sort of. But then we got the Gen Z coming up. Right? Then we got my kids that are middle schoolers. Uh, you th as a, one, of the, one of the young, I'm not the youngest anymore, but one of the youngest governors in the country, it is amazing what we still don't really appreciate in terms of the priorities and needs of the next generation. And, and we have to take time to do that, which is why I put the council together. So one of the things I really learned was, again, what their priorities are, right? They're very into the environment. They're very into um, you know, making sure that we have a, you know, sustainable living for the long term. They have a high, they, they really appreciate the, the, workforce, uh, the workforce housing issue that we have, they, they just want to live in an apartment, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a decent area and not have to commute uh, such a long way. And they don't want to have to commute down to Boston. There is an urbanization, right, between about, about the ages of 22 to 27, 28. A lot of folks are going to go to Boston. I, I can't compete with that. I don't try to compete with that. But when you're ready to uh, get married and, and buy a home and pay taxes and have kids and think about school, that's where we go get them at the 28 to about the 35, 35 40 year, year old range. That's where we're really focusing on a lot of our younger families. So that's where a lot of our discussions have centered around. Um, the environment is a big deal with them. I was an environmental engineer, I get it. You know, one thing we talked about a lot with that group was uh, where to promote solar power or wind power. Um, I gotta be honest, I'm a big believer in offshore wind. I've become a convert, I really have. Um, five or six years ago, very skeptical. The prices were still sitting at $30 you know, 30 cents per, per um, kilowatt hour. That's really expensive stuff. It was cost prohibitive. It was gonna require massive amounts of money out of the private sector to keep that going. You can get the cost down to six, seven cents now. Makes sense, we can do that. So I'm pushing to, to try to get uh, this first study done, maybe partner with Maine, the strongest winds uh, in, the, in, the, in the country really are available right off of our shores, 20 mile offshore, you wouldn't even technically see them. Um, and we can tap into that at a very low rate. The technology has gotten us there. Right? And talking to some of these folks and understanding what their priorities are and then matching that with what the financial, uh, the smart financial move would be and it was actually waiting a little bit, made, made a little bit of sense and now we can move forward with new technologies and do it in a very smart way. Solar power. I'm a big believer in solar power. I'm just not a believer in dumb solar power. And by that I mean bad projects. There are bad solar, solar projects out there. Right? These massive arrays that raise rates where uh, power generators get premium rates, not wholesale rates like everyone else, but premium rates. And who has to pay for it? All the rate payers. Who benefits the least? The poor. Low income families benefit the least from renewable energy. That's just a fact. So I'm all for solar energy, but guess what? My plan is this. I want it in, to be honest, trailer parks. I want it in apartment buildings in Manchester. I want it for low income families that do not normally get the benefit of it. I think the days of subsidizing millionaires to put solar power on their house are over. They, by all means, put solar power on your house. I think it's great. Why should I be paying for it? Why should you be paying for it? Let's let those that turn on a light switch every day and don't have the money in the pockets to pay our very high electric rates be the first to benefit economically. It's that simple. We have a few more minutes, so I wanted to wrap up with a couple of uh, different questions, personal questions. Uh, my apologies in advance because the first one, this is my attempt at a clickbait, try to get a media headline out of this event, but... Oh, we got some media headlines, I'm sure. <laughs> would, uh, but would you ever consider... Look at Josh Rogers back there, I'm sure he'll come up with something creative. <laughs> well, maybe this will tee it up, but um, would you, you just were recently reelected, but would you ever consider running for federal office? I'm sorry, what? <laughs> I didn't understand the question. I'll read it again. Um, would you, ever, would you ever consider running for federal office? Look, the US the only Democrats I'm, I'm fighting right now are the, 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 the knuckleheads in, in Concord trying to impose an income tax. Those are the only ones I'm focused on right now. <laughs> What's, uh, now that you're in your second term, uh, we'll switch gears away from the, the clickbait headlines. I don't know how successful that was. but um, what, What's your favorite part of being governor? 
uh, you've been at the job now for for a while, and I imagine your experience has changed uh, the, the oh, longer totally. you've gone into it. Yeah, I, the, so that's an interesting question. My favorite part, I'll tell you the toughest part first. The toughest part is schedule. I, I mean, I got I got a 14 year old, a 13 year old, a six year old. I mean, I have I, I try, I've had to travel a lot, especially lately. I haven't been home in the last couple nights to put my little guy to bed. That's tough. That's really tough, and especially with a, a family and a wife, especially that. Um, I mean, my, my wife hates politics, and who can blame her? She does. My wife doesn't know how to ski and hates politics. <laughs> I've tortured this poor woman, and she's such a saint. She is such a, a, a saint, I cannot tell you. Um, so it's hard personally, but the thing I'm, I, I, I like more than I thought, people wouldn't, the way I talk, I know you don't believe this. I was number seven of eight kids. I was so shy. I was the kid wrapped around my mom's leg when I was dragged at events. I didn't like to talk to people. I just wanted to be home. I, I was so shy. And in many ways, you don't, a lot of people don't realize this, I'm still incredibly shy. Um, um, I've, you know what I love? I love the stories. I'm shocked at how much I, I really do it. It sounds cliche, but I really enjoy sitting down with people. Sometimes they're hard. You gotta hear with, with parents that have lost loved ones uh, to the opioid crisis. You have to hear about barriers in mental health, why their kids didn't get better services. You have to hear why a veteran isn't getting his benefits, whatever it might be. But you hear great stories too. And, and you hear things that can like totally open your eyes. And getting to travel the state, I grew up in here and I've been here. You think you've traveled the state, you haven't until you really travel the state and you go to the hidden nooks and crannies. And as governor, I mean, I've, I mean my first time I, I've been to a lot of the places everyone's been to. Kind of going into last year and into this year, I try to spend time in places that I haven't been. I was in Odell, New Hampshire. Does anyone know where Odell is? I guarantee I'm probably the only person in this room that's been to Odell. Um, you really can't get there. There's only fire roads. You have, I took a, a snowmobile there the other day. Beautiful, beautiful part of right, New Hampshire, right in the center of Coas. It was amazing. And uh, I was invited to come back and to do some fishing and all this. And you know what I saw there as well? I saw a dam that had, had breached and the state had kind of forgotten about it for years, and I want to make sure we can help I put more money into taking care of dams. When you go to these hidden nooks and crannies, you, you find amazing families with amazing stories. Why are they there? What drove them? What, 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 how many, you know, go talk to the families in Randolph, New Hampshire, up, you know, that kind of sit between Berlin and, and Littleton, if you will, right? What drives them there? What are they, what are they doing for a job, right? What are, they, what are their biggest concerns? It's very different than Manchester, Nashua, and the Seacoast, where a lot of the, the hubbub is. So I really, really enjoy that and listening to the stories of folks that you otherwise wouldn't stop in and, and talk to. But as governor, you're like, hey, let me pop into this gas station and see what happens. Because I've, I've gotten to the point, people kind of recognize me a little bit now, a lot of it, frankly. So that when the governor walks, they go, holy smokes. And then you sit and you talk and you have a cup of coffee, and it's great. And then you do the next one and the next one and the next one. That's, that's the fun stuff. Well, that, that leads perfectly right into my, my last question about your, these stories that you've heard because I, I think it's interesting you're as you mentioned you're an Hampshire native um, your family has has very strong roots here you have a come from a political family you clearly knew a lot about New Hampshire prior to being elected governor and I'm curious if you know maybe per, through those stories if there's something that sticks out to you that you learned about this state that you didn't know uh, before you were elected governor that's, that I didn't know since, oh boy, that's a, that is a tough, I'm sure there is, don't get me wrong. Uh, and I'm gonna try to keep it, there's a lot on the negative, again, you hear a lot of those tough stories about an issue that was there or there, and you're like, holy cow, I didn't realize that that situation existed, let's try to help it fix it. Um, you know what I didn't know? I, and this is uh, out of state a little bit. Um, and, and I'm not uh, doing this just to tout the, the Trump administration, but I gotta tell you, I am shocked at what great service we get from the secretaries. And the, and the president and vice president himself. They pick up the phone. They call you back. And, and I always thought, boy, as governor, boy, could, you know, can I get, could I maybe try to get a meeting in a couple months with Secretary Chef? No, just pick up the phone and call her, governor. Oh, okay. And she calls you back and you talk about an issue and they solve the issue. So again, you've heard my, my rant on Congress, but when it comes to the administration from those that can really affect change and provide some flexibility or a little bit of gap funding there. I mean, a good example is, uh, Last year, Voc Rehab, an important program, kind of skilling up uh, a lot of folks in, in the DD world, you know, and, and kind of on the spectrum. But they have great workforce skills, and these are programs that are vital. And through massive mismanagement before we got here, um, the program was left like a million and a half in the hole. We had no way to fill that hole. We didn't realize Frank Edelblut, God bless him, the guy's a, a financial genius, found the hole and said, we got a real problem here. So I picked up the phone to Betsy DeVos. I said, I need help. 
She said, great, let's talk about it. Explain the, the program to me. I did, we went down, we sat with one of her, her folks. Three weeks later, we got a $1.2 million grant to keep those programs viable, right? They're, they really do want to help, and they're very accessible. I'm shocked at how accessible. And I'm not, I don't think that's necessarily unique to the Trump administration either. I think that I, you just don't appreciate there is actual accessibility if you go to the right folks and the folks that can really implement change and know the importance of Im implementing change, especially for a governor or a mayor or someone at an executive level. That, so that's been very impressive to me, and I'm, I'm shocked by it. Governor, thanks for spending some time with us this morning. Thanks, Governor. Just want to say a quick thank you to Governor Sununu again. Uh, thanks to our sponsors, Dartmouth Hitchcock, Dr. Conroy and her team for their great support this morning, uh, and Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare, New Hampshire Families, and Oracle Dine for also being our sponsors. And thanks again to the New Hampshire Institute of Politics and St. Anselm College for being our host. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.